Hello and welcome to Long COVID Foundation podcast. This is the channel where we share educational information on Long COVID to help you understand your symptoms better. In just a moment, we'll have a roundtable discussion with leading scientists on neurological damage post COVID in association with other chronic diseases. Please watch this talk from start to finish because it will help you to learn more. And just very quickly, if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe button because I can help you to get answers relevant to your symptoms. Let's jump into our interview. So hello and welcome to Long COVID Foundation podcast. Today we have a very special roundtable discussion on neurology issues and post-COVID damage and association with other chronic diseases. And I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Michael Van Elzeker, who is a neuroscientist affiliated at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Dr. Van Elzeker intensively studies neuroimaging to understand neuroinflammation in patients with post-traumatic stress disorder, chronic diseases, including the condition of an ECFS. So Michael, thank you very much for being with us today and it's such a great honor to have you on our channel. Thanks very much. I'm really happy to be here and to meet Dr. Manon as well. At the same time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bake, who is a medical and scientific advisor at the Long COVID Foundation, uh, researching neurological long COVID, and who is scientist at the Aga Khan University. Welcome to our channel. Thank you very much. Okay, it's always a pleasure coming to a forum like this. Uh, and I would love to welcome Joachim Gerlach, who is entrepreneur and scientist who helps us investigate the real causes of long COVID, and at the same time is developer of a nutraceutical solution called Vitisinals 9, which tackles long COVID symptoms from many pathways. So Joachim, welcome to our roundtable discussion today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to learning a lot today from our two experts. Thank you. Uh, so I think the topic of neurology has been widely researched. However, we still have so many unknowns, in particular when talking about long COVID and biological mechanisms of neuroinflammation. So I think we would proceed as follows. So maybe Michael, uh, would you start with your introduction and presentation to hear your perspective on this subject? And then Dr. Bake uh, on challenges that neurologists face when we discuss long COVID. And we will have a roundtable discussion with questions at the end of your talks. So, Michael, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so, I'll start here. Um, so, the term neuroinflammation is used somewhat broadly sometimes, uh, maybe a little bit more broadly than it should be. Formally speaking, neuroinflammation, uh, the term inflammation, would include the penetration of circulating immune cells into the brain's parenchyma or the, the tissue of the brain. So it means that there are cells, immune cells penetrating into the brain. Um, that is the most formal definition of neuroinflammation. Oftentimes when people talk about neuroinflammation, they refer to a phenomenon uh, called glial activation. Um, so glia, the term glia is Greek for glue uh, because it used to be thought that these cells, uh, glial cells, simply held together neurons. Um, uh, but it turns out that they're neuroimmune cells. So the neuroimmune cells of the brain are called glia and they activate. Uh, and when they activate, that is often what gets referred to as neuroinflammation. So if uh, here you've got the, the microglia, which are the resident macrophages of the brain. So macrophage means big eater. So those are the type of cells that collect either pathogens or broken up cell parts, things like that. Um, they phagocytize them. Uh, and whenever they come in contact either directly with pathogens like viruses or bacteria, or with uh, inflammatory molecules, and in this case, cytokines. So that those are inflammatory molecules. The microglia activate. Uh, they sort of turn on and they actually change morphology or shape. So they, they pull in their arms. Um, they actually change to sort of a, a thicker, wider phenotype. Um, and they release a bunch of uh, excitatory substances, uh, substances that excite neurons. So, you know, these little triangles here are meant to symbolize cytokines, um, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are proteins 
uh, that, uh, you know, signal inflammation. Uh, and the little lightning bolts here are just meant to symbolize um, lots of different mediators or molecules that excite nearby neurons. So things like glutamate, well, which is an excitatory amino acid, ATP, prostaglandins, bradykinin, nitric oxide, lots of different things that excite neurons that are nearby. Um, they also produce this substance here called the translocator protein or TSPO. Um, TSPO um, is uh, a substance that is measurable by PET scanning. So positron emission tomography scanning. So in other words, when these cells change their shape and morphology, um, and, and they activate, we can measure it uh, with this protein here because there's a PET scanning uh, a ligand, a type of PET scan that measures this protein. Uh, so this is the main way that we measure what's sort of referred to as neuroinflammation in living humans. Uh, you know, we have a PET scan study going to measure this in people with so-called long COVID, um, you know, we have another one that's been up and going in, in MECFS. Uh, it's, a, it's a really common measurement. So, um, you know, when, when there's neuroinflammation, there's immune signaling, nearby neuroexcitation, and the translocator protein uh, activates. That neuroexcitation um, means that nearby neurons get excited. Uh, they are more likely to fire an action potential or to turn on. And, you know, unfortunately, that probably also means that there is a little bit of loss of signaling efficiency or a little bit of loss of signal to noise. Um, and that's probably part of the reason that people have sort of, you know, abnormal cognitive effects. They have trouble sleeping. They have trouble thinking straight. They have trouble remembering things. And, you know, we're doing a study to, to measure that. And, uh, I'll, I'll pass the floor. I can get more into that uh, as we go, but I'll pass the floor over uh, for now. Thank you so much for, for this detailed overview of what is really driving this neuroinflammation. So, uh, Manan, would you give your view on challenges that you see in long COVID people from a neurological perspective as well? Uh, as Mike said, you know, like... Uh, when uh, uh, a virus or a toxin sets up the central nervous system into a charge mode, you know, and all those excitatory neurotransmitters and, and substances get released, you know, at that time, you don't expect a person to be clinically uh, normal. I mean, they start exhibiting features which can vary from person to person because of uh, the affection of the brain lobes, different regions of it not uh, no two uh, uh, persons are alike and not uh, we cannot predict that where the virus or the toxin is accumulating much. So if it's temporal lobe, the, the findings would be different. If it's for the frontal lobe, the findings would be different. Occipital lobe, uh, he could have or she could have visual hallucinations or problem with the vision. So it's just a random thing, but then uh, I'm very uh, uh, excited to see that uh, the PET scan can trace this uh, the translocator, uh, because if it's released by glial cells, it would be a fascinating thing because where you have got neurons in the brain, you also have got the, those glial cells. So if they are the mode of bridging between the virus or the toxin and the neuron, and we could measure uh, the activity of it, I think that that would be a remarkable thing to do in, in long COVID as well as MECFS. So <clears throat> the, the uh, features that we see Last time in your forum, okay, when we had that panel discussion of uh, Long COVID Foundation, you heard me saying that uh, these substances and uh, the, the features of Long COVID clinically, if you list them, okay, they are over 100. I mean, like, uh, and 70% of them are referable to central nervous system, peculiarly to central nervous system. So uh, the reason we are investigating the central nervous system effects of uh, Long COVID or the, the, the effects of, on the brain that leads to cognitive function loss, be it tinnitus or hearing loss, or, or, or even uh, difficulty in concentration, the memory thing, it, it revolves around that pivot okay of, of, of brain inflammation, if not the direct influence of the viral attack, which of course is also playing a role. But then the inflammation, which is secondary to it, uh, plays a major chunk and, and, and causes those symptoms. Right. 
Thank you. So uh, uh, what would be your perspective, Michael, uh, in terms of SARS-CoV-2 being persistent and replicable? So uh, what the process behind this can, uh, can be and uh, how the disease could progress? So we know that uh, it can persist, but uh, what it causes to, to the neuron inflammation? Yeah, there are a couple sort of big, important, um, I guess you could call them controversies in, in the field. So one is the level to which there is neuroinvasion of the virus, the level to which it goes into the brain. And the other uh, related is the level to which the virus persists after acute symptoms have, have resolved. Um, you know, it certainly is possible for the virus to get into the brain. Um, now, whether or not that is what is causing most people to die acutely uh, is another question and whether or not that's what's causing long-term sequela like, uh, you know, so-called post-acute uh, sequela of COVID-19 PASC or long COVID. That's another really important question. Um, it's, a, it's a hard thing to study um, uh, because, uh, you know, there, the, the enzymes that break down RNA still exist after someone has died. Um, so it's a difficult thing to study in, in, in autopsies. Um, uh, uh, so, and then the, the question of viral persistence in long COVID as well. You know, it, it does seem there's plenty of evidence that the virus persists past acute symptoms. Um, uh, uh, you know, in, it's been found in gut. Uh, there's been several studies um, just now starting some studies in, in long COVID proper, but most are studies of people who died after COVID, not necessarily with long COVID, and the virus was found a, a couple of months later in tissues. Again, a difficult thing to study. Um, you, have, you have to try and find protein, RNA, and f see if the virus can culture would be the sort of gold standard. Um, from our perspective, if there is a viral reservoir in the gut, which is, I, you know, I think there, that's, it's an important claim, so there needs to be a lot of evidence, but my, my sense is that that will be something that comes out. Um, the, one of the things that I focus on is the vagus nerve. Um, so the, when I talked about those in, inflammatory cytokines, those are molecules that are produced by immune cells all over, not just glia in the brain, um, uh, when they activate. So it's, it's part of inflammation. So what's interesting is those molecules are kind of big, they're proteins, and they don't really easily go across the blood brain barrier. They don't really easily float through the blood and get into the brain. So there must be some way that the brain knows that the body has inflammation and the brain to, to anthropomorphize says, okay, you're sick, go to bed. Uh, you should be saving energy. Um, and the vagus nerve is important for this. So it detects cytokines in the periphery, including the gut. So it, it detects inflammation in, uh, in you know, the lining of the gut, the lining of the lungs, the, the esophagus, places that come in close contact with the outside world where there's likely to be infection. So this signaling pathway, and it doesn't mean that it's doing something wrong, it's doing its job uh, it, by detecting inflammation. But if there's an inflammatory milieu in the gut, or if there's persistent virus that's causing an inflammatory response, that will get detected by the vagus nerve that sends a signal up to the brain, signaling the presence of infection. And that pathway, that signaling pathway, is the reason that people feel sick, not just with long COVID, but in general, sick with anything, um, uh, viruses, bacteria, things like that. Wow, thank you so much. So we know there were some studies on toxic peptides produced in guts. And uh, how do you think these toxic peptides could be fueling the process of vagus inflammation and possibly lead to chronic fatigue or long COVID? So I don't know the specific study that you're referring to or, or what people mean by the term toxic peptide, but uh, in general, um, the, the, you know, there's kind of two branches of the immune system. There's the acquired branch and the innate branch. So the acquired branch has a really specific um, innate memory. That's the reason we get vaccinated, right? There's a particular immune uh, memory that's ready for particular pathogens. The innate immune response is not specific. It's broad. It's more ancient. So it's the kind of thing that includes things like fever, 
um, uh, and vagus nerve signaling cytokines, uh, it activates whether there is uh, a bacteria, a virus, uh, a, a parasite, um, even an injury. So if something is causing an activation of innate immune cells, um, uh, then that will cause the signaling pa pathway of immune cell activation mediators that excite or, or turn on the vagus nerve and then signaling up to the brain. All right. So, uh, Manan, would you give your view on this and how vagus inflammation could lead to chronic diseases that we know exist? And at the same time, maybe talk a little bit about the immune system and autoantibodies. Okay. So, uh, I mean, a lot Mike has already filled in. Uh, he told us about how the vagus actually can convey the messages. One thing is important when you are considering an autonomic nerve, okay, be it sympathetic or parasympathetic. Vagus nerve is parasympathetic, and we know uh, that for uh, other uh, afferent uh, signalings, okay, it's responsible for many visceral afferent signaling to the brain. You know, I mean, like even if you're not sick, okay, it carries impulses from the carotid body, aortic bodies, okay, it transmits it to the brain, loss of pharyngeal, the ninth cranial nerve also included. So they, they, are known to feed the brain with uh, the information of that uh, internal value that what's going on in the body. Now the question is that uh, what happens when the gut gets inflamed or the pleura gets inflamed or the heart gets inflamed? The thing is that there are two things. I mean, like it could be a, 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 neurotop, a, a chemical okay, that excites some uh, afferent nerve fibers in vagus, vagus actually transfers it to the brain brain gets informed that something has gone wrong. There's one more interesting perspective to this, that you see when the SARS-CoV-2 okay, is actually causing the damage, you know, and the inflammatory uh, environment that it sets up, there could be a direct damage to the afferent nerve fibers themselves, which also generate uh, action potentials which are conveyed to the brain. So if for a moment, okay, if we leave the neurotransmitter or the cytokines aside, even damage to the afferent nerves can be conveyed directly to the brain. And Mike was so right in saying that that brain itself uh, has got no, it has got an eye which could see outside, you know, but it has got no eyes that see inside, you know. So there is a way that it actually does that is that it, it says the afferent to, to, to bring that information, then it computes it, processes it, and then responds to it. So let's say a guy has got typhoid, okay, for the sake of argument, or let's say he has got. Uh, intestinal infection caused by E. coli. Even you see those guys, okay, they, they would say, I'm not going to the job today. I'm not going to the school today. Where is my pillow? Okay, I would like to lay down. And 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 uh, feverish or not, doesn't matter. The feeling of unwell is there. So if you examine the patients of CE, uh, ME, okay, CF, uh, C, uh, CFS, okay, even patient with long COVID, tell me what do they say? I heard a guy last night on Twitter, okay, he said that this is my 13th hour in the bed, okay, and I'm just like, the battery is being charged, and I'm just like, I'm not feeling like even going to my fridge, fetch some drink for it, okay, because I'm sick. This is how human narrate it, okay, they speak of, they communicate, they say that, that I'm sick. Why are you doing that? I mean, like, vagus nerve or other nerves, okay, afferent, we call it visceral afferents, or or, or the ones that supply the viscera, gut is a part of it. So if they are communicating something to the brain that I'm not well, the body is not well, tell me how the guy is going to react. He would say, I don't understand my condition, but then, you know, like, I don't feel like uh, driving. I don't feel like walking. And then, and you know, uh, at many of uh, uh, the guys, they ask me on, on, on different social, I mean, media channels that, that why I'm feeling that much fatigue. You know, fatigue, fever, all of these are protective mechanisms of the brain by which it makes you rest so that your protein could be conserved and those proteins and amino acid could be utilized for the formation of antibodies and stuff. So it's not new for us, the, 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 the pattern by which the long COVID is presenting itself. For What's new for us is the virus. What's new for us is to know how it is causing it. We are humans. I mean, like we will uncover it, uh, like it or not, in, in uh, coming year or something. We don't leave things behind. But then the bigger question is that, and, and I'm sorry if I'm bringing a non-scientific discussion into, into, into the environment, is that it's hard to convince even medical science guys, you know, like 
this person is a sick excuse me it's not boiling up in his brain he's not making this up 3.7 million 4.1 million guys would make it up together in the same way same pattern i mean uh, they won't go i know like the chartered accountants i know like bank managers i know like guys who enjoy their careers okay they would like to sleep on the bed and then not not come out of it come on give me a break here i'm i'm not buying this at all so uh, it's only one of the patients said i went to a cardiologist okay he said that what is the long covid i mean like if the cardiologist and pulmonologist are not getting updated by the recent literature and it is pandemic it's not like a single plane crash it's like uh, 42 uh, plane crashes a day i calculated okay like a maximum flight attendants with the crew included okay what are we getting mortality rate daily is like for 40 41 plane crashes one plane crashes okay it's all over cnn and bbc i mean like 47 plane crashing because they are not crashing you know the guys are dying i don't know when we will get educated on this so he's right visceral afferents do the job vagus particularly is getting attention wait for 3 months they will say pelvic splanthic nerve also is conveying it from the pelvis to the spinal cord and then pulses are going up it's a cousin of vagus nerve you know uh, beyond the level of kidneys okay down they actually carry the parasympathetic job so we are learning yeah the disease is in, in its infancy i agree but when did it happen that infants cannot go grow to child and, and adults i mean like they should come into contact with the literature we should get ourselves and our peers educated so that there is a very broader engagement with these groups because and i, I don't know it came from my heart okay i didn't plan and write it you know in one of the paper published i said that if you just ignore them you are going to get a disability road that that the counting would be impossible you know like like they are the disease is not that lethal but it's very disabling so we uh, i'm glad that we are turning our focus to me and cfs uh, uh, sok with, with the excuse of long covid but all of these chronic illnesses need to be addressed and the etiology found and and the pathogenesis is uncovered so that appropriate treatment could be designed thank you thank you so much so uh, yeah. michael for example feel that you're in for for a long time could you explain describe us the whole process of neurovascular inflammation and how this uh, blood brain barrier is being affected sure yeah i mean the you know the brain is one of the most energetically demanding organs in the body it uses a, a truly huge amount of um of energy uh you know so, something like a fifth uh, of of the blood's oxygen uh because it's you know it it does so much it's it's active all the time um so it needs a lot of vascularization and and if you don't mind let me just share my screen again really quick so i can show you a cool image so this is an image um of the brain's vasculature taken by a colleague of ours named John Palamani um who's an expert in ultra high field resolution imaging so uh mris magnetic resonance imaging are a type of a brain scan uh and they're usually done at 1.5 tesla strength it's a measure of strength and this is a 7 tesla so a very powerful magnet you can see the extent of the brain's vasculature and this isn't capturing all of the tiny tiny uh capillaries but just showing that there it's there's a ton of vascularization in the brain um but the brain doesn't necessarily have the greatest immune system uh of the body uh so it has to have a protection uh that prevents uh you know things that it doesn't want to get in and that's called the blood brain barrier um the blood brain barrier isn't like a filter at the neck uh which some people sort of picture it as it's actually a a a form of uh of cells that wrap around um the vasculature of the brain so one of the types of glial cells those neuroimmune cells that i mentioned before are called astrocytes so the astrocytes have little feet that are called end feet and they wrap around all the blood vessels in the brain in all of the the entire brain except for sort of seven little areas that are that are uh little windows in the blood brain barrier called circumventricular organs um so um this is a a barrier that prevents uh you know larger molecules including cytokines theoretically it should prevent pathogens uh from getting into the brain proper 
Um, but of course, those the 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 blood brain barrier is just made of cells, uh, and there can be damage as well. So, it, one of the things that's been really shown over and over again in in COVID is the extent of vascular damage, um, and and I'm talking about acute COVID. Um, uh, so we don't. It, there's a lot of different reasons. So it could be direct infection, or it could be coagulation cascades. It's just a big inflammatory push that run, runs through the veins. So if that happens, you can imagine that the vasculature of the brain is greatly affected as well. Um, uh, so um, astrocytes, including other glia, can activate when they sense damage, when they sense injury. Um, one of the problems that we face is that these are cells that live a really long time. Um, and they're not replaced by circulating brand new stem cells. They replace themselves by splitting. Um, and so if they become active and activated, um, that can last for a long time. Um, uh, and they can sort of remain activated uh, and sort of lose their function a little bit. So, um, you know, further research is needed to, to, to show whether there's loss of blood brain barrier integrity it's not kind of an all or none thing. There's a spectrum. So it could be, you know, slight damage in one person or particularly bad damage in another. Um, but it is one of the many forms of pathology that needs to be chased down. And um, uh, yeah, I guess I can just, just for a moment, I can talk about the glymphatic system if you don't mind. So this is the, the cerebral spinal fluid flows across the, um, uh, the vasculature, sort of along the, the vasculature there's a system that pumps out um, the fluids, interstitial fluids that wash through the brain. Um, they mix with the cerebral spinal fluid and they, they, that's part of what sort of cl cleans out the brain every night. Like I said before, the brain uses a huge amount of metabolism and metabolism produces waste, um, right? So when the brain is working all day, there has to be a, a system, a mechanism that cleanses out the metabolic waste on an ongoing basis and especially at night. Um, so this is the glymphatic system. And this is a video from the National Institute of Health. Um, on the right side is an enhanced version uh, of, uh, um, uh, of a pumping mechanism that happens with every heart rate. Um, on, on the left side is something that's a little more physiological. Um, what this shows is that heartbeat and breathing moves the, the bottom of the brain, especially up and down and all these areas of white here are where cerebral spinal fluid is. Cerebral spinal fluid is physically pumped through the brain um, and along the, the line of the vasculature in the brain so that it washes out uh, the waste of the brain. This increases fourfold at night, um, which is why it's so important for people to sleep well. Uh, and when sleep is disrupted in long COVID, this cleansing system is disrupted as well. So that might be part of the problem. Um, so these are areas that uh, our research group is, is um, you know, really studying and, and trying to do so in, in uh, living people to, to measure these, to see if this gets disrupted. And I think it's a really important um, topic of research. Yeah, exactly. The symptom that you've mentioned is sleep apnea. So people can't sleep. They, they're always very excited, nothing helps, melatonin is not helping at night, they are uh, awake. So this is a real issue that cannot be identified actually. And we quite often see that people are uh, complaining that MRI scans don't show anything. So I wonder if uh, this particular image uh, as you have shown would, would be accessible to other neurologists who would be able to direct this particular uh, research into scanning properly brains and identifying the real cause. So um, Manan, I think you've talked about um, sleep issues in your previous presentation. So could you give a little bit uh, on that as well? See, uh, I mean, like uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a vicious cycle, you know? So if uh, the diagram that uh, uh, Mike has shown us, okay, and if it doesn't drain good, you know, uh, there is accumulation of, of uh, toxins and the things that should normally be cleared from the CSF. <clears throat> Excuse me. Accumulate them, they stimulate the neurons. The neurons, when get stimulated, you cannot sleep. When you cannot sleep, they cannot get cleared. Okay, so now you understand why I was saying a vicious cycle. 
So the, if that vicious cycle sets up, okay, so, and, and it's uh, in, in play, uh, the uh, insomnias, okay, which are complained by the patients should not surprise us. I mean, uh, and, and uh, the thing is, uh, who knows, I mean, the, the tachycardia or the palpitations that they are complaining, okay, would be a compensation of the heart to do that at a, at a uh, speedier, uh, speedier way to get them drained even when the person is awake. So, so there's a compensation mechanism in humans, okay, we only know few of them. So if you are awake a lot, normally even in a person without COVID, you know, you ask him if he's awake for more than 14 hours, his heart rate gets up and high above 100. So of many mechanisms that the heart has to do, one of which is that it, sh it should be getting some signals from the brain that the, my CSF is not being drained. Okay, you pump that good so that the slide Mike showed on the right hand side would drain it fast. But as he said, okay, it happens four times at a greater speed at sleep. There is no substitution to the sleep. Now, the thing that actually uh, amazes me, and, and having said that something about blood brain barrier, Mike, is that uh, here at the level of the nose where you get the maximum viral load, you know, and, and we only think that nose is serving as a reservoir to take the virus into the lungs, there is an upward route through the cribriform plate here through which actually things like olfactory nerves do hang down. But uh, there are um, published medical literature on parasites like Linklaria palry, the brain-eating amoeba going up through it. Just imagine, uh, amoeba itself can accommodate like what, uh, uh, more than uh, a million SARS-CoV-2 in its uh, cytoplasm? So how it's like a, a very un un unimaginable thing that the virus seeding here would not go to the brain through this route. So that, there comes, uh, Mike, that ma direct invasion thing that we speculated and published. And then later studies in nature science confirmed it, okay, neuroscience. And, and uh, that group actually showed traces of viral mRNA in the cribriform plate, olfactory bulb, olfactory tract and stuff. Now, if, if we take what Mike showed us and connect it to this, a uh, very few guys in um, uh, our Mike may be knowing it so very well, you know, but then we can't uh, say that that all of us should, uh, studying medical science and neurology should know it. Here, the olfactory nerves which are hanging, okay, very few people know that it's covered with a sheath of, of meninges, okay, which has got CSF in it. And just imagine that if that virus, okay, just passing by damaging the olfactory nerve causing uh, uh, anosmias tends to get into the CSF, who is looking for the blood pain barrier? The virus is already in, you know? So I tried to uh, just like shake the peers and the community with so many papers, okay, look at it, okay, because uh, the norm, uh, books of anatomy would say that, that CSF is here and, and I've got a proof, okay, Mike knows it. You get a fall from a tree, okay, you get a fracture of the base of the skull, you know, you get start running, uh, running nose. And that running nose is discharging a fluid, which is not blood, which is now serum, which is CSF. Million dollar question. We call it CSF renoria. From where is it coming? Right from the root of the nose. So if you have got a CSF here covering the tiny nerves, you know, and the SARS-CoV-2 enters from here, just forget about it that it needs any blood brain barrier damages. Okay, damages are now on their way. Because as Mike said, <clears throat> once the blood brain barrier is breached, you know, anything in the blood, okay, which has got normally being repelled by the barrier, barrier, okay, would get into the melee of the CNS. And then if it's attacking from two sides, okay, just imagine what would be the magnitude of the damage. You call it uh, uh, neurological damage in acute COVID that you see, and long haulers are a picture of it, okay. And, and that's the reason I keep on emphasizing, uh, I don't know, in incoming few months, okay, we will see that, that happening, that the viral loads here, okay, if they persist, Okay, uh, again and again, the, the virus will come into the uh, brain milieu and the blood and, and tease the immune system again and again. You will have flare-ups, then good days, then flare-ups, then good days. It, it will keep on going, okay, if we don't address these issues. And I just say really quick to um, Manan, that this is a, it's a really important point because the, 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 the very existence of the glymphatic system, the it, it's it was rediscovered. I, it was it was yeah. you know hypothesized many years ago, but it was rediscovered in 2012. This yeah, is I read gross that paper. Anatomy. I read yeah, that. Yeah, it's a great paper, paper, right? Nature yeah, paper, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, great, great, interesting stuff. Uh, so this is a this is a paper that just you know that I just read uh, a couple of days ago 
okay. that's showing it's this is gross anatomy. This is, you know, <laughs> I'm, you know, we are still understanding and figuring out how these mechanisms work. So when people yeah. state things very confidently about the brain, I think we have to have a little bit of respect for both the complexity of the brain that we don't understand and have respect for these pathogens um, right. that can do a lot of things that we are um, that, that 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 can affect us in different ways including at these areas where we're just learning how it even works yeah very right and i would be uh, uh, it would be a pleasure okay if you would like to work on this aspect of cribriform plate okay accessing it because there are ways, okay, in which we can stain the S protein or the virus, okay, and see in these guys that whether it is taking that route or not. So uh, today, after, after today's presentation, okay, let, let us be in touch, okay, because if you are interested in this particular niche that uh, could bypass the blood brain barrier, okay, we can collaborate on that. I, I agree. I'd love to talk about it, and I think it would be a really interesting thing to um, try to 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 get some information out there for pathologists because what yeah. they do is they take a chunk of the parietal cortex. Yeah, they look for the virus and they go, well, virus isn't here. And yeah. it's like, okay, you're not even, you're not even looking at the right circumventricular place. organs. Yeah. yeah but, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't even make sense. You're very right. Well, and, thank you so much. I think that was very, very nice uh, explanation about the real damage uh, caused to blood brain barrier. And uh, it may play into uh, chronic diseases as, as a first instance uh, of that. So um, another interesting thing, understanding the whole picture of uh, neurological damage. And what are your thoughts in terms of how does mast cell uh, activation uh, play a role in this and histamine and IgE B cells and glial cells get into play so all, all together? Uh, because uh, we can't treat uh, mast cell only, as we know, there is neurological damage happening as well. So it should be some kind of an understanding from both sides what is happening. So what are your views on that? Um, yeah, so it, this gets back to one of the really fundamental important questions in so-called long COVID or any of these chronic conditions is, is there a persistent pathogen that's driving problems, right? Because if you see mast cells activating, um, you know, one possibility is that they, they just activate for no reason. I guess that's a possibility, but a much more likely possibility is that there's something causing that. Um, you know, I think a lot of research um, uh, in biomedicine over the last 50 years has been really focused on the immune system, which is great and it's really important. Um, but we have to remember that uh, measures of immune responses are somewhat easy. I'm not disparaging anyone who does important work on this, but you can take blood from the arm and measure inflammation mo molecules fairly easily, but whether or not there are pathogens or microbiome in tissues is very hard. And so one out of a thousand studies even tries to look in, in tissue, uh, probably less than that. Um, uh, and you know, so you're going to get a thousand studies reporting inflammation in the blood um, to every one study that even tries to find a problem happening in tissues. So I, I, I do think that it matters. Of course, people die from cytokine storms. Inflammation can be really important and damaging. Um, but if there's a fundamental question of why, why is this being driven? Um, if it is a so-called autoimmune response and there's, it's, your body is sterile, there's, no, there's nothing driving it, then immunosuppression uh, is, a, is one angle you can take. But if there's something driving the inflammation, then you ought to at least address that root cause as well. Um, so I, and I think the point sort of generalizes to studies of Im Im immune responses. You had asked previously a little bit about autoantibodies. I think that's another really important thing to think about. Um, you know, antibodies are very sort of sticky molecules. They're somewhat polyspecific. They're sort of meant to be specific. Um, but, you know, those of us who come from a sort of a, a, a molecular biology background know that when we do assays, you know, you, there's techniques that you can do in tissues to use antibodies. A huge problem when you're doing these studies is called nonspecific binding. So you do all kinds of controls in your experiment because the antibody that you actually care about is mm -hmm. supposed to bind to the protein that you actually care about 
but it binds to other stuff all the time. So there's a ton of things you have to do in these studies to make sure that's not happening. So when you hear a term like autoantibody, is it the case that the antibody is just directed at self? Your immune system suddenly hates you um, and it wants to attack you? Well, I'm skeptical of that. I think we ought to call them autoreactive uh, uh, antibodies where they were probably, again, to anthropomorphize, intended to attack. Um, and in, in reality, um, they are binding uh, to self uh, due to a phenomenon called molecular mimicry in which um, there are, you know, pathogens mimic host proteins, host mediators. The whole reason the SARS-CoV, or the main reason the SARS-CoV-2 virus can enter is because it mimics something that fits into the ACE2 receptor. Um, so when the immune system sort of attacks a pathogen, there can be cross reactions. So I just, that's a, a general point to make that you're going to see a lot of studies showing immune abnormalities, partially because it's easy. And I don't necessarily mean that, I don't necessarily think that means that the immune system is the core problem. Manan, would you, would you add something to that? You have to be investigated and we need to have a very clear uh, database evidence, okay, that the histamine or the mast cells are being driven here. And the thing is, <clears throat> which I find a little uh, path of pathogenetic significance is that, uh, you know, body has learned uh, from its evolution that something it dislikes, okay, if it enters the body the second or the third time, it reacts very aggressively to it. Mast cells are the ones which know the, the, the rules of the game, you know. So um, uh, my thought is that if SARS-CoV-2 expo gets exposed to your body, okay, for the first time, let's say acute COVID, and it recognizes any part of it as an antigenic one, okay, it mounts an IgE response, immunoglobulin E. And as Mike said, okay, uh, antibodies are specific, they know where to glue. IgE glues so very good to the mast cells and the basophils that if it keeps a memory of that, and we are listening about reinfection again and again nowadays with SARS-CoV-2 different variants, second time, third time, whenever it comes again, okay, Mike knows, okay, we call it in medical science as hypersensitivity. We no more call it immunity, you know? And why do we call it hypersensitivity? Because it's an amplified immune response. It's not the conventional one. And this one could possibly kick start the mast cell and say, release all of your cytokines, the reason you have got that cytokine, cytokine storm con contributing to the patients with long COVID. So it, it's not a one exposure thing. My thought goes to a repeated exposure thing. So if let's say in the body, like Mike said, in the gut, okay, or sinuses, or somewhere in the in the in the brain, it actually evades the immune system, and it comes again and again. Uh, I think the only concerned cells should be the mast cell, okay, which actually this time mounts a greater immune response known as hypersensitivity, and it actually puts your body on fire because uh, the guys, okay, who know what anaphylaxis is, what penicillin, penicillin hypersensitivity reaction is, they know the meaning of mass cell activation. You, it flares up your body, you know. When it does it locally in the lung, you call it asthma. Cut, uh, do, does that in the gut, you call it allergic gastroenteritis. But when it does it generally in your body, okay, you call it anaphylaxis. So something like that must be acting in uh, behind the scenes. We need more data, okay, to, to actually wind this thing up, you know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and I think one of the last questions uh, from me would be, um, in ME-CFS development, uh, Mike, do you see a tryptophan pathway uh, involved into the development of the disease uh, and going into a chronic state? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a really central pathway in how cells respond. So it's almost certainly involved in some way. I mean, the, the question is why? Um, you know, what, is there something driving this? Is, is, has it entered into a sort of a self-fulfilling cascade? Um, you know, the metabolic pathways um, are, so viruses, um, they don't, they don't eat, right? They, they're not really alive. They're very strange entities, right? In order to do anything, they have to hijack host cells, right? Um, a virus uh, sort of sitting there isn't, isn't really harmful. It gets into your cells. And what it does is to hijack host metabolism. Um, so it has to hijack 
uh, the, the metabolism and genetics of a host cell in order to do anything. Um, and when cells activate um, uh, due to viral uh, infection or detection of pathogens or even detection of inflammatory uh, molecules, they enter into uh, a, a metabolic state called Warburg, a Warburg-like state. Um, if you've got a, an excess of cells in this state, you're going to see uh, metabolic abnormalities. Uh, Dr. Proal and I wrote a review article about this a, a couple of years ago. Um, you're going to see a, a, a situation in which a lot of cells are in a metabolic state um, that has disrupted tryptophan signaling. You know, you know, and it's in this case, it's not sort of for no reason. It's because it's being driven by an inflammatory process that perhaps at root is driven by a dysbiosis or infectious process. So um, that pathway is, is surely involved in some way. The question is why. Yeah, that's really important to understand the whole picture mm -hmm. of that inflammation that is usually the cause of many symptoms that people experience. So uh, I'm glad that uh, you are also looking into the main drivers what, uh, and asking questions why. <laughs> So we, at the foundation, we really love the question why and what should we do with that? So uh, Joachim, would you, would you like to add some questions uh, that would be interested to, to cover in this discussion? I would have a million questions, but that's, uh, maybe I can start by um, looking at, back again at the uh, so-called neuroinflammation. So if I understand that right, we're having here uh, several direct uh, pathways that lead to these conditions. One would be a direct viral or pathogenic damage to neurons. That would be like impairing the, the neuronal system, the nerve, nervous system itself, and maybe even by demyelination or any other process directly connected to neural or, uh, or synaptic functionality. Then we have the second one is the indirect uh, damage by inflammatory uh, conditions that would then damage the, the system and there can it branches off into signaling if i understand michael wright and uh, also menon we do have a problem that there is like a more, more a signaling problem that goes into the cns into the vagus nerve system and then back to the brain and this feedback loop between the gut and the brain and other body parts will lead to sign to a kind of an over alertness or over alarm state in the in the uh, complete nervous system and so, and then there, of there, there's again some other branches going off. I mean, the uh, the tryptophan kinurinin uh, uh, pathway question is related, and uh, we we have other um, work on that where, where where there is an ACE2 kind of connection to the tryptophan uh, depletion in the normal system. So that will play again into the um, uh, let's say the the precursors of neurotransmitters. Uh, including serotonin and most of all melatonin, and so that and that would affect again the um, the process that Michael was describing and showing this beautiful uh, MRI that uh, we can really see the, the 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 cleanup at night that is happening that is kind of being tempered by that. So that would be my from my side like a, 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 a try to try to wrap that up in a into three categories, and I hope that uh, I'm right there. So the, the, the next question that I would still have would be the uh, involvement. We, we know from uh, Dr. Bruce Patterson's work that there is a, um, a monocyte activation um, that is connected to the CCL5 branches pathway. That means these monocytes keep uh, ha have ingested, so to speak, uh, spike proteins, and they prevail for months at a time and uh, send out a signaling cascade, and they are obviously also involved in the central nervous system. What is your take on that one? Um, so I think the, the, the question at the end was uh, about the spike proteins in monocytes. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a really important question. And it, this, this gets to sort of one of the core questions is, um, you know, there's studies that show viral RNA. There's studies that show viral protein. Um, and, you know, the question is, do those represent a complete virus or do they represent left behind RNA or protein? Um, uh, so it, it, the gold standard study, which is hard to find whether a virus is still there would be to find both its RNA 
and its protein and to be able to culture it to show that there's viable replicating virus in your sample. So when people report spike protein uh, in monocytes, there's a core question of whether there's a reservoir of viruses that is producing these spike proteins or whether the spike protein is simply residual and left behind floating around. Um, both of those are possible. I personally think that a reservoir is more plausible. Um, you know, viruses are just sort of machines that produce proteins and genetic material. Um, and so a, a, a large amount of spike proteins or any other proteins of the virus are produced by a reservoir um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more skeptical that there are proteins uh, left floating around. And then other groups would argue that there are RNAs left floating around, um, where the most plausible argument is that both the RNA and the protein are simply left uh, by viral reservoirs that are producing these things. Uh, it's a really important question. And again, it's harder. So it's way harder in research to find a viral reservoir uh, than it is to find something in blood floating around like an RNA or a protein. And you're going to, you're going to get a thousand studies showing something in blood for every study that even tried to show whether there's something. Thank you. Manon, you also have some thoughts on, on that. Okay. So, you know, when you say the word, okay, you heard it from Mike, uh, uh, monocyte, macrophage, okay, what's its function? I mean, like, just go to the root of the knowledge, okay, you get the answer. I mean, like, uh, they, they present the antigen to the lymphocyte one, they are the scavenger cells of the body, okay, they, they actually do the clearing in the organ, okay, they, they actually remove the dust and the remnants. So in, the, in this context, okay, you heard me scavenging cell to just like clean up, you know? So here I join my discussion to what uh, you heard earlier, okay? That, that when if they are clearing that uh, remaining proteins, okay, and the RNA, it's not surprising to find uh, these residues of the viral protein inside the macrophage and the monocyte, only because this is their job. Now, the million dollar question is that its presence inside the monocyte and the macrophage, is it driving any pathway? Is it like kick-starting some downstream uh, links, okay, that actually could produce some, some adverse type of body effects, you know? And that actually is something that we will have to wait in this pandemic to uh, data to come, okay, and then actually uh, grip the concept of how it's causing that pathway to get activated. So yeah, their finding in, in monocyte macrophage is not surprising, but what they are doing inside the macrophage and 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 the monocyte, it it uh, needs a very hardcore data to to actually support it. So in time, we'll possibly get uh, the answers, but then I think that. Uh, it's it's uh, the 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 main thing okay that we do in in COVID science is to not leave a, a niche of the research okay if even the results are not coming you'll go knock the next door you go knock the next door till you get the answer so so if if they keep on focusing that okay if we found the protein what pathway is like like I'll give you a simple example if you if you culture these monocytes outside the body and you take out the condition medium. Okay, and just check that uh, what this condition medium has got uh, other than the ones in the control, possibly the answer is just in front of us. So we'll have to have more data on this. May I ask one more question? Valentina, is that okay? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, uh, I won't go into any more details, it's more, no more a general question. Uh, as you have mentioned, Manon, we are uh, ourselves and many other groups are driving, diving into each rabbit hole of pathways, what kind of damage is being done in which kind of cascade and causative order, uh, where are maybe the upstream mechanisms, where are the downstream mechanisms, are they prevailing in long COVID or not? Are they just uh, connected to that? So we actually need to divide the work into three, three um, let's say main categories. First, the identification and the proof that these mechanisms are really happening and how they are happening. And the next one would be then, what would be the diagnostic tools to see if that is still uh, happening in non-COVID patients and in which ones, because not everybody will have the same mechanisms still at play. And parallel to that, the interventions, be it pharmaceutical drugs or be it nutraceuticals or both in combination, that would be what we need if you want to provide solutions to the long haulers, understanding the problem 
proving it, diagnostic tools, and then treatment. That would be for us the best uh, outcome possible if we can achieve that in, in the next months to come to get a deeper understanding of this condition and this disease. Yes, I think you are you're right. And um, it's vital for scientists to understand that there is, should be a clear link between the symptoms that people experience and widely experience and the list of symptoms is huge and dig into what are the real causes. And I think uh, neurology here is quite crucial uh, because you can visualize, you can see the link of nerves going from brain to gut and potentially there, there might be something in the gut associated with all these inflammatory markers that people have. So, uh, yeah, so I think that uh, that was our discussion, the main, uh, to basically to summarize the main damages that we see from neurological perspective in long COVID people and driving that from ME-CFS experience. So um, any questions from, from you guys, what you want to summarize from your perspective, where science should go next in order to understand long COVID? I could, if I could add something, okay, it would be a minute thing, but it's important. Uh, and having discussion with uh, the patients with long COVID and and uh, some recent papers published in Nature, okay, on on uh, the scan and CT scan and MRI changes in patients with long COVID and the COVID, uh, I mean, uh, findings in uh, early 2020. <clears throat> I want to emphasize one thing, you know, and it struck me and. Uh, I, I, I attempted to write on it, is that we should appreciate and realize this, that long before you get some gross changes which are visible on CT scan and MRI, the damage has started months earlier to that uh, gross change that you appreciate. So if it's appearing on the scans, that means the damage has been done, okay? And for neurological tissue, I say it with a grim heart. Um, Mike would second me on that, that except for one or two areas in the brain, okay, you don't get a neuro regeneration. These are permanent cells, damage for once is damage forever. I mean, until and unless you get a magical stem cell therapy to replace them in an in a anatomical way, okay, it's not possible. So uh, uh, recently we wrote a review on that and uh, we wanted uh, the community and the peers to get alert on that, that there is an aspect known as molecular injury, which has got biochemical markers for it. And patients are symptomatic at that stage. We should not wait for them to have a no, uh, abnormal CT scan and MRI, because by the time they get an abnormal CT scan and MRI, the damage is already done. So there should be early interventions when they are complaining. I, I'm saying this only because many at the tutor, okay, they say that uh, I did a, uh, my doctor did an MRI and CT scan. It is normal, you know. He says, why are you complaining so so many things, you know? And we fail to make him convince him, okay, that we have got that problem. Exactly, this is the point where the molecular level damage is going on. It must be having some biochemical markers, not visible on CT scan and MRI yet. So we should we should uh, actually we should know uh, we should accommodate the concept of the biochemical injury. You know, which I don't see is happening now in 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 many clinics and neurology practice. You know, we should know that it first damages at at a molecular level and then comes the change. Okay, after you have lost substantial uh, brain matter. So if it's appearing on CT scan and MRI, the damage is already done. We can't do much about it. So intervention uh, should come at a point where molecular damage is going on. You trust the patient's symptoms. You actually have confidence in your signs that you see, and, and that's the time where we can save. So on this note, okay, I, I just like I would like to uh, the community to appreciate that, that uh, after diagnosing it, on the MRI and CT scan, okay, we made no big uh, contribution. I mean, like damage is already done. Thank you. Mike, would you like to add something? Yeah, just that the, 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 the whole ability to measure problems is a, a ma massive area of research across fields, not just long COVID. So it's a huge part of what, you know, at my center, for example, they're trying to develop new techniques to measure for the first time the ability of cerebral spinal fluid and the glymphatic system to, to flow and move. These are 
again, it's gross anatomy. These are important functions that we really don't, we really can't measure them yet. It's, a, it's an area where the people who work on the methods are working on the, even the ability to, to measure, much less to detect if something is wrong. Um, so that has to move along with um, the needs of patients because uh, a lot of the testing is simply not sensitive or appropriate enough to pick up the problems um, that we're seeing uh, 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 in, in that people report. And I, I just, it's a really important uh, movement in research is to improve testing methods. Thank you, thank you, Mike, and thank you, everyone, for this detailed discussion. I appreciate everyone's time, and uh, I hope people and um, will take this discussion and share more medical practitioners and people who suffer with long COVID and ME-CFS to help us raise awareness about long COVID and its impact on people's well-being. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for watching, yeah. and goodbye.